Yes. Hi, how are you? I'm Tamara Calder Richardson. I'm the director of INES, which is the International Association of Near Death Studies. And this is the Charlotte chapter. So I see a lot of new faces and welcome. So uh, I'm going to give this to Mark and then you can introduce everybody, okay? Okay, and you, you'll you get the panel. The panelists can come up on stage okay. too and then we'll get started with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Mark Brooks. I'm uh, an author and I wrote a book called Christianity from a Spiritual Perspective. And uh, it's up on Amazon. If you're interested, you can type in Mark Hunter Brooks is my middle name, and that'll bring it up. But it's a red book, um, and you can you can read the information about it. I don't I don't want to get too involved in it because we're here to talk about near death experiences, and I want to to welcome everybody here and uh, welcome the panelists. What we want to do today is talk about things related to NDEs and NDE after effects that. Uh, near-death experiencers normally don't talk about when they give their testimony or talk or discussion about, oh, this is what happened to me. Um, we wanted to dig a little deeper, dig a little bit sideways, dig a little bit forward and backward to kind of get some more information out there on the table. Now, uh, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves in a minute, uh, but we will uh, spend about two minutes per question. That's about how much time we have. So per, per person, per question, uh, which will give us about an hour. I'm going to try and get us out, he out of here at 1 o'clock or as close to 1 o'clock as we can. Uh, and if we get through the questions uh, quickly, I'll see if we can open up the floor to any questions that you guys may have. I also have something here, too, just in case we want to spice things up a little bit, is uh, the panelists can do yes-no responses the questions <laughs> only only if yes, no. only only if we uh, have to pull things out of them you know and uh, I also supplied the questions to the panelists up here on stage so you can read it and get a little bit uh, advance notice of it so it won't be a total surprise or a shock to you when I ask the question and you'll have a chance to review it um, so, but before we get started, oh, and I do want to thank Norman again for the, the questions. Uh, Norman and I worked together on them, but they were mostly his. If you find a question that you like, it was probably Norman's question. So, uh, thanks to, to Norman, and we will get started. He's saying that for the questions you don't like. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I didn't want to say, I didn't want to say the other thing. So, and we've got the mic up here for the panelists, and... Before we get started, I, uh, I want to Im impanel the panelists with an oath. Okay, yeah, so raise, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, I promise to answer all questions truthfully. I promise to answer all questions truthfully. And if I don't do so, and if I don't do so, I'll howl like a Siberian husky. Oh, I can do that. I will howl. Okay. So, so, so you've you've been in panel. I had nothing to do with that part. So. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make that clear. So, yeah. So, so we have uh, we have ten questions that that we've written down that we'll go through, um, and uh, we have about an hour. So. That'll be six minutes per question, two minutes per person, more or less. You can go a little bit longer, a little bit slower. I can keep the pace up or, or slow it down a little bit. And uh, then we'll just see where it goes. So um, the, uh, the things that we'll cover today include the near-death experiencer's environment that they were in, the nature of their body and the nature of their mind, how their beliefs changed, uh, we'll ask a question about their sharing their experiences with others, and then I want to talk about non-psychic after effects that they had as a result of their NDE, because we talk a lot about psychic related uh, after effects, but what happened aside from that? And we'll get in. And, and I have uh, examples in the questions to help you uh, with it. Yep. Uh, can we start with Susan and introduce ourselves? Yes, can we start I, I will. With you okay. and Here, yeah. you. So, so I, I will I will start with uh, Susan and let uh, Susan, Daystar, and Tamara introduce themselves. Yeah. Hello, I'm Susan Caney. Um, 
I guess I had my first near-death experience when I was born because I was I had a hole in my heart and my lungs collapsed. And um, my very first remembrance was seeing this teardrop-shaped, um, colorful, just bursting with colors falling from the earth and that being me. Uh, and then after that, um, from the time I was a little girl, I was having spontaneous um, spiritual experiences, out-of-body experiences. And then I would guess I would say that my one of my most major ones that really woke me up to understand that I wasn't just flying at night physically was when I was 17. And we can go into more detail about that later. I don't want to say all that now. So that's me. I'm Susan Caney. <laughs> oh my God. I'm uh, Daystar Dial, and I have had four near-death experiences and lots of out-of-bodies along the way, and especially as a child, um, and a kind of lineal awakening in the past five years. So um, thank you for coming, and hope we can uh, assist everyone. I, I just love this. They're both so powerful, and that just doesn't even cover how awesome they are. Uh, hopefully you'll find out. Uh, I'm Tamara Calder Richardson. I started this group uh, a couple years almost ago, February, um, because I believed in the message of Ions and I wanted it to be a platform so other uh, people of interest could come together. Um, I've had six near-death experiences starting with the prenatal. Um, when I was three, I had a nail go through my head. You're thinking, how did that happen? I was playing, but anyway, it did on the nail head and I had a hole in my head two years. That was a direct connection to God. I don't recommend it. It was. I mean, it was a hole in my skull. Um, it, that could be like a joke followed by that. But uh, <clears throat> at that point, um, I saw uh, spirit people around me. And then at four, car wreck, five, uh, had pneumonia and died. And I was out quite a bit for a long time. And then I was in an induced coma um, because my lungs collapsed. And then uh, 10, drowning at Myrtle Beach, got hung up under some guys playing volleyball, and then um, then I had a reaction to a pill, an arrow one pill that I took by a doctor. So, um, anyhow, that's it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, we'll, we'll get started, and the first question oh, is uh, related to uh, NDE experiences, and uh, most NDE experiencers have common elements related to their experience, like and Tamara mentioned some of these, an intense feeling of joy going through a tunnel, encountering beings of light. Did anything happen during any of your near-death experiences that you might consider to be uncommon or unique? And you can use the mic to answer. Um, my third experience, um, Tamara brought it up earlier, um, a day of uh, awakening and feeling not quite right, but I didn't know what was happening. And went to a meeting with my work at my workplace. Was to meet some engineers on top of a building, and were to look at pumps who were who were to, who was to arrive at the workplace at noon. Right so, um, so not feeling right. Had a meeting. Went to my office, and I'm not feeling good. So I decided to have my blood pressure checked, or go to the cafeteria and get my blood pressure checked. And during all of this event with myself, no one was around. So it happened, everybody was out of the office, no one was around, no one was in the cafeteria. So I go in and check my blood pressure, and it was like 70 over 45. And I said, oh, I think I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> and I barely made it back to my office, which was probably as close as from here to the, to the uh, front door. And I just reared back and sat down in my de at my desk in my chair and realized my spirit was leaving my body. And not only that, I'm seeing this band of angels. You know that you hear the song, Band of Angels Coming After Me? Well, they were coming. And, and I said, I'm not ready to go. I really like it here. And as soon as I said that, the, the angels just turned around and went back from whence they came. And that was it. So in two hours, I was up on top of a building. My spirit had, and what I figured later, as I reflect, is that my spirit was like leaving early that morning, you know, just preparing. But I didn't realize they were coming for me. And why, I have no clue. 
I have no clue. It just happened. And I just, I, I said, I, I don't want to go. I, I want to I wanna stay here. I'm really liking it here these days, you know? And I was. First is a time when I didn't really like it, like being here. Susan? Well, um, the reason I mentioned earlier when I was 17, I would say that was my first major, major one where I realized I was out of my body and not in my body was because I was, while I was awake, I was physically pulled out of my body by a being of light, and, which I did call an angel at that time, who at that time then told me that um, he was going, to, that my prayers had been answered because I always did want to know about God. And he was going to uh, teach me about heaven and hell. And that night was going to be my first lesson. So that was definitely out of the ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm thinking about, you know, I have such lavish things. But the thing that, that kind of touches me that I think about is, uh, when I was three and the nail went through my head, um, I was uh, playing with my cousin. I was at a very antebellum type uh, home and we were playing hide and seek. And the house was fine. I don't know why they had a nail under the dresser, but they did. And um, I know I've told the story of Mark and he said, please don't tell the nail story. Everybody <laughs> cringes, okay, at the freaking nail story. But just, it's good, okay, it all ends up good, okay. Um, and it wasn't like I drilled it in my head or anything, it wasn't like that. Um, so I was playing and I was bouncing, you wee, like a kid everywhere. And, uh, you know, you, you know how kids squeal, woo! And so I'm um, running around and I was jumping and under the dresser was a nail hammered like this and it had the nail head in it. And when it went through, I didn't know it did. It just, I felt some horrible sharp pain and I thought it was water and then it was blood. And then um, I collapsed and uh, it's, I don't know why it was there, but it was underneath there. I wasn't sure, I didn't really know what had happened, quite honestly. I really didn't know till later. And I'm looking, uh, it's just like they say, I felt nauseous and woozy. And then I'm looking at myself above my body and soon as I did that, I could care less. I could care less that was my body. I could care less. I just felt so free. And I'm looking at this, and then I'm seeing people run in, and I'm seeing the whole scene from above. And I'm seeing what they're, I'm hearing everything they're saying. So that's why I always tell people in hospitals, don't be talking crap about them in the room, because they're hearing it all. I'm like, shh. Um, I heard every single thing. And then while that's going on behind me, I saw all these beings of light come into the room. And, and, I, and the first thing I thought, or who are these people? Because I'm three, how many people do I know? You know, my grandparents, my mom, uh, my aunt, a couple, you know, aunt and uncles. I mean, I don't really know that many people, but there was, they kept coming in. Like they, there was a few and then there was more. And I would say there might've been a hundred to 200 people. So I didn't know who they were, but they seem, um, uh, benign and and uh, peaceful and non-threatening and then I had this being over my head which I perceive it to be an angel because it was not human and it was about nine feet tall and it was the brightest light you've ever seen and it was very um, I mean I don't I have a better word glittery it was like had gold flecks and it was very bright and it was over my head and I believe that was my guardian angel healing my head. And later on I heard Uriel, but it was over my head. It was big, it was powerful. And then I heard a voice, which I can't prove this, but I'm 100% it was God. Because I did, it, was, it was like a voice no one argued with. And it wasn't just a voice, it was a perception. It was a beingness, it was everything. And it said, this is not your time, you have much, uh, much to do. So... It was kind of like no one argued with that voice. They were like, okay. So everybody started believing. They started popping out like, time to go. <laughs> Pop up. Okay, he spoke. And um, since then, I, I think that, that first one, that really changed me. And especially how indifferent I was to my body. It was like so easy to get rid of. You know what I mean? I didn't have any emotion tied to it like you'd think you would. Uh, next, we'll talk about the nature of the near-death experiencer's environment. 
So regarding the place where you went during your NDE, did it contain multiple levels, like veils or dimensions? And, and if so, what did those boundaries look like? Uh, did you have elements there that you wouldn't see in the physical world? Uh, or did you hear any music or experience any sounds or smells or tastes? And uh, what, in, in two minutes each, uh, what was the most unusual thing you remember seeing or experiencing about the environment during your near-death experience? Or one of them, in the case of multiples. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> When I was physically pulled out of my body by the beam of light, that was part of it, was that I was going to experience different levels because there are different levels and it's all about energy and the slowness of the energy, how slow the energy is would be the lowest level where it's you know almost to, to a complete stop to where going up to the highest level is uh, an energy so refined and so I don't know, refined or fast, it's, that, uh, that you, can't, you cannot experience it in the physical body because if, if that energy came into your body, your body would disappear. Um, so we level here on the physical earth, we are actually experiencing one level, I suppose, of, the, of heaven being at the level where we vibrate physically. And what I got to experience with the assistance of this being of light was I got to experience with his assistant without being harmed the, the lowest level of energy and what it felt like and it felt like black tars on the way I can describe it and then at the um, one of the middle levels was uh, a place where I guess a lot of people would call heaven and the colors there uh, there were buildings made of light that just seemed to glow there was like pathways and gardens. I got to experience being a purple iris. So with my house, you'll see in spring, I have just a huge amount of purple irises going because I came to identify with them so much. Um, I did get to experience the most, the highest uh, refined level of energy where I got to experience the, the fullness of the I am, being I am. and expanding throughout the entire universe and knowing what that felt like. Um, uh, that's, uh, what was the other part? Was the... Oh, you pretty much covered it. Okay. <laughs> that was good. That was good. <laughs> Interesting with my four that I've had, each one I had the choice of staying or going. I went a certain, you know, depth or, or to a certain location. And I had a choice at that location, like my office, whether I, you know, there I wanted to stay, and the others, it was my choice of whether I wanted to stay. So going to the other side, uh, I have experienced many times since as a result of the work I do. I'm, I'm over there quite often with folks, especially uh, with folks that I help assist to the other side. So I'm seeing these places, and I'm seeing these angels, and I'm seeing these different dimensions. I, I say that I live in this multi-dimensional world because I'm always <clears throat> experiencing something that just isn't, you know, 3D. I mean, like every day. So with my four experiences of near death, it was like a choice. So, but there was a time uh, after my first one, speaking of smells, and when I read this, you know, that I, for some reason, I lost my eyesight. And, uh, but as a result of losing my eyesight, my other four senses were just like, zoop, 100%. And it's like, okay, I could do without the eyesight with, you know, with all this happening. But because my other senses were just out of this world. But eventually my eyesight came back. And another thing, speaking of my eyesight, I woke up one day uh, five years ago, six years ago, wearing glasses since 93 and realized, looking out the window, I didn't need my gla uh, glasses anymore. So I have those experiences as a result of choosing to stick around. <laughs> I've been given a, uh, a, uh, uh, an extraordinary life uh, for myself and, and for others that I'm able to assist. Wow, these are beautiful. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to focus on the, the question here at different levels. I will say that 
uh, when I had uh, the car crash and we I was with my mom and stepdad when I was um, four we hit a tree it was icy snowy we hit a tree uh, and during that experience uh, I went through you know this is pre car seat okay yeah. I'm over 39 okay <laughs> it was it was it was pre car seats and I went through uh, uh, into the the, it was a Pontiac into the Linda Big Dash. And I was sitting in the middle, those you know bucket seats that are, go across, and I uh, went through the window and I felt an impact and I felt things. Um, it I felt an impact, um, and then immediately, immediately, I didn't feel it very much because it was so quick. I, I felt I didn't feel it as you would think I would feel every aspect of it. I didn't. I just knew it was an impact. Um, and I was immediately popped out, and I was, uh, I went into this uh, afraid, and then uh, uh, cold, and then that went away really quick. And then I was in a tunnel, and, and apparently the tunnel is, 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 we make fun of these tunnels, but uh, apparently it's not very common. I don't know why, maybe it was just a perception thing, but it was a tunnel I felt being sucked through. And it was the darkest dark, but then I saw Jesus at the end, um, and he had the the uh, the holes in his hands, and he had like a fan on his hair, and people behind him, like I felt like I knew them, but they're relatives. And then he said that I had to go back, but when I came back, um, I saw between dimensions. I saw like a rip um, in to my right. I was in the car, but not really my body i saw rip in the universe and then i saw different on um, the park that we were across from different time periods happening at the same time which is impossible because it was icy and snowy you know so it's kind of impossible but you had uh a native american family there was cooking a fish holding a baby like that's impossible then you i saw like an 1800s family with a old buggy walking through so uh, and then I saw a hot air balloon in the sky. So I saw different dimensions, and then I saw spirit people that used to be, there was a firehouse there, and they came over, and they were walking around. I guess the guys that used to be firemen. So I began to see between dimension. So that was a big thing. And in another one, I heard angels singing to me. And sometimes I still do hear angels singing to me. And, and it, yeah, I agree with what Daystar, my whole life you carry this back with you. So there's like, and I know Susan too, but I'm not a speaker, but you know, I, I have strange things happen to me all the time that are, I, that are beautiful though. Uh, regarding your body, how did your body change during your near-death experience? For example, did it look like a ball of light? This is question number three. Um, did it become transparent or translucent? Did you see or feel energy flowing through it? Uh, or did you acquire any new senses or abilities such as telepathy or astral side, enhanced sight? Uh, so how did your body change while you were having your near-death experience? If it changed at all? Or your experiences? I can say, looking back at my first um, at a time when I didn't want to be here, and I'm not for sure if I was depressed or just did not want to be here. Uh, my baby was just a few months old and possibly suffering from postpartum depression. But there was a part of me that not just didn't want to be here, but it's like I wanted to go somewhere else, like there was a place waiting for me. So, but after my first experience and knowing I had the choice of leaving or going, and when I was taken up, it's like, okay, I'm, you know, thank you, you've come for me. Now I look back and make sure this is what you want to do. And when I looked back, I saw these people, miserable, you know, <clears throat> pain and anger and just everything but love. And that's when I asked the question, where is love? And I was asked if I would come back and, and teach love, and I agreed to. So that was my transformation at that moment of, of feeling a love like I'd never felt before. I can't say that uh, I always call my one at 17 one of my most major ones and I can't recall them. I, I mean, I looked above my body looking down at it screaming, I'm dead, I'm dead, oh God, I'm dead, oh God, I'm dead. And crying, but as far as looking at it changing, no, I can't say that 
my physical physical body changed. Um, the the only the physical where I really experienced a physical change was when I was nine, and uh, I was supposed to have immediate open heart surgery after my mother took me to the doctor, and the doctor screamed at her that I was dying, and that if I didn't have the open heart surgery, I would I would die, and um, in the hospital that night because back then they didn't have you know they didn't let parents you know stay in the room with children like they did then and, um, I was uh, crying and uh, shaking laying in my bed and uh, all of a sudden <coughs> light started shining really bright um, underneath the door and then the door opened and then I was blinded by a light <coughs> and then, uh, then it like it was like a woman. It was a, a woman nurse, and um, she came running over to me, and I, I was crying, and I said, "I'm afraid I'm going to die." And she just scooped me up in her arms and said, "Honey, you're you're not going to die. God's got plans for you, and uh, you are not going to die." And she sat down with me in a rocking chair, and uh, I was immediately put at ease and just felt so comfortable in her arms and I asked her what her name was and she told me her name was Love and I went, oh God, what a great name. <laughs> your name is Love, best, it's the best name I've ever heard in my life. And I said, what's your last name? And she said, Love. <laughs> you mean your name is Love, Love? <laughs> And she said, love, love, that's my name. Ask me again, I'll tell you this name. <laughs> and that's, that's the best name on the face of the earth. I'm just, that is such a great name, and I love you, love. And she said, I love you too, honey. And I said, love, would you hold me until I fall asleep? Because I'm so afraid and I don't want to be alone in the bed. And she said, honey, I will hold you this whole night through. And I woke up. And the next morning, and with um, two men who came into the room to do an electrocardiogram on me, and it just to uh, make a long story short, my heart had completely healed up during the night, and I didn't have to have the surgery. So that changed. How how did you perceive your spiritual body, though, as opposed to the physical body? Uh, that night, I did not see my spiritual body. Okay. I was just being held. I thought it was all in the physical to me. I didn't, if it was out, <clears throat> I saw the being loved, love as a human woman and being held by her physically. It doesn't mean that it happened that way, but I was nine years old and I perceived it as all happening physically. What, what, what do you think she was? Oh, an angel. She was an angel. <laughs> like an angel. Exactly. I just wanted you to say that because it's awesome. <laughs> she was an angel. It was awesome. She, yeah, it was the light because the light first, and then she manifested into oh. a human form that I could understand. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff. Um, as far as my body changing, um, the physical body is just a physical body. It's just a meat body. Um, when I was outside of um, my body uh, and during my near-death experience, I was nothingness. At some of it, was nothingness. But yet I was all thinking and conscious. There was one, the pill, the one when I was 20 and had a reaction to the pill that it was different because I didn't go to the highest level. When I was nothingness and different ones, I I was nothingness in the galaxy. And then when I went to, we call heaven, and I hung out with Jesus three days because I was an induced coming because they couldn't get my lungs working. I, uh, I was, I had like a body and everybody glowed there. Everybody glowed, they looked glowy. Everybody looked glowy and healthy. Um, but when I had my pill thing that I had a reaction to, 28, it was like for menstrual migraines. It was like it was just like I don't know. It just that's another thing with end of years. They have sensitivity to medicines. So um, I started saying I was. I woke up. I, I was kind of protesting taking it because it didn't feel right for. And the doc, my MD, said, "Oh, it'll help." And I woke up with being. It was like bells went off. And I woke up and I couldn't. I had no motor skills. I couldn't talk. And I couldn't relate to my husband laying beside me like, help, something's wrong. So I, I just kind of 
it, it was almost like I animated my body and got up, but I couldn't think properly. And I sat on the sofa, turned on the TV. Within a few seconds, I didn't know it was a TV. And then I didn't know it was male or female or my name. I thought, well, this can't be good. And um, then I, I got frightened, but I knew what comes after that. I don't care. <laughs> so I had to try not to get to the point. I don't care. And I began to see um, furniture in lines and everything in outlines. Have y'all seen that movie, The Matrix? You know, The Matrix where everything turns into lines? That's what it looked like. Everything, I was like, and I knew this isn't normal. And I began to see, because I was becoming what I think more spiritual and less body. So I was looking at it through my spirit eyes and everything was made up of energy. I mean, we think this is hard. I mean, I don't want to go run my car into the brick wall or anything, but um, but they're made up by energy and lines. And then I was kind of out in the galaxy and I thought, this can't be good. So I, thought, I only had one of these things and I knew I had to act quick. So it was just me. I took one little index finger and I kept poking my leg to put myself back in my body. I kept poking it. That's all I could do. I saw I couldn't even talk. And because I knew, look, my head's not cut off, you know, <laughs> I'm not into this, this is this, I can get through this. But yeah, my body was more a form of energy because it was a lower level, but the higher levels, I was nothingness, but yet all thinking. Uh, next, we'll talk about your mind and your near death experience. Uh, did your mind change in any way? Did you seem to understand things that you didn't know before? Uh, was there ever any point at which you lost your sense of individual identity? Uh, and did you ever experience a sense of being one with everything in the universe? So, yeah. Well, that's a big yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did I lose my sense of self-identity? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, at the point where I became one with I am, I recognized and felt the entire identity of all people on the earth because every I am is I am. The I am when you say I am is the same I am that I say I am. It is one. We may think we're all separate from each other, but we are really one being. With my last experience, um, you know, their experience, and yes, I went to a river to meet my grand, my godfather who was there sitting beside the river, and I said, how, how did this happen? I had an automobile accident. So, um, but he informed me how it happened and, and, and what I should have done differently, but it's not time for you to go. And so that meant I had to cross back across the river and come back, but when I came back, I realized at some point, some days later, that I had also suffered or witnessed, let me say, I don't like to say suffered, I witnessed a traumatic brain injury that took away everything that I ever knew. I had to learn to read, write, count my money, drive, had to start over with my three-year-old grandson. He was my teacher uh, for many years. So uh, it, it wasn't until, and all the side effects that go along with the TBI, it wasn't until the past five years, uh, six years that I've come to a point where I can, I can do most things. I just have to micromanage my time and, um, to, you know, because of fatigue. But um, that was most unusual to come back and awaken to realize that I had nothing in my brain that I once knew. So, but during that entire recovery, it was, it was just, um, spiritual experiences nonstop, and and I lived in another realm, and still trying to live in this 3D world and relearn again. So I, I thank God for the, and the goddesses for the, all those who were there to assist me, and I had some of the best healthcare providers. But um, but that was what was different for me after after my last was coming back with with nothing except my wide open for whatever God had in store for me. And here I am. Thank you. You're, you're both amazing. Wow. Um, oneness. 
I felt complete. You know, you ever hear people, you know, when they, if they've led a full life and then they go, well, they led a complete life. I felt complete. I felt like nothing was undone and unsaid. I felt whole. I felt complete. I felt... a love I've never felt here. It's, I miss it because I see the, the crime and the lies and you don't have that there. It was just beautiful. Um, there's so much love. That's all that it is. This is the only language that's there is love. And, um, you know, part of my thing was, like, I was agreed to come back, and Jesus said people didn't laugh. I need to help make them laugh. And I said, well, that sounds pretty easy. Um, <laughs> then he told me a bunch of other stuff that didn't sound easy, and I said, I don't think so. I'd rather stay here. And then, and then he said, well, I need your help, and you won't be alone. And I said, well, if I'm not alone, okay, maybe I'll do this. But, um, you know, I don't want to promote it too much. Everybody's going to start drinking Kool-Aid, but uh, the funny Kool-Aid. But it, it was a place of love. And it, I have moments of sadness because of that, because that there's an intensity and a completeness and a wholeness that you, and a joy that I, 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 have, I, I can't, even the greatest love I can't experience here. So I don't know if I answered the freaking question, did I? <laughs> All right, I'm done. You can drop the mic. <laughs> Come on back. Um, so um, there's there's aspects of the near death experience that change you, you know, when you come back, and uh, a lot of people. Uh, one of the questions we'll talk about is. Uh, sharing your experiences with others, the uh, non-psychic after effects, but uh, a lot of people are interested in how your NDE changed your religious beliefs or what you believed before your near-death experience. Were you an atheist? Were you, you know, into organized religion or were you spiritual? And then what, what happened as a result? Uh, so regarding your, this is question number six, uh, regarding your religious beliefs, did your near-death experience change your belief and, and these are just for examples to kind of stimulate your thought. Uh, karma, uh, reincarnation, such as did, did you encounter deceased relatives there? Uh, free will versus determination, you know, like were you given a choice or were you told to come back? Uh, and then eternal life and the afterlife and the things that you saw. So uh, how did your near-death experience change your, your religious or spiritual beliefs before and after? Um. I have to say, uh, I was into the karma and reincarnation and all of this before my first near-death experience. I was I was studying this after I um, dismissed myself from the Southern Baptist Church um, early in my life. So, and, and I was studying this um, young, but so I, I've had the opportunity to study many religions and, and experience these uh, traditions from many uh, others beyond uh, Christianity. So, um, so beyond that, I, it was like probably a, a deeper, I would say, uh, a deeper knowing of, of what these other religions were about, I suppose. But I studied before and after mine. So I don't know if there was anything much different for myself besides being open to all as we are one. My dad was a United Methodist minister, and I grew up in a traditional you know, Christian background. I, I guess it was because of my very first, I guess, near-death experience being born, but whatever, I was a bane to my father and every church Sunday school teacher that, we, that I ever had because I questioned everything that we were taught. And, you know, it was like in Sunday school one day, and I said, okay, I know everything about Jesus. You know, Jesus is born a Christian by Easter. You know, Easter, he's risen again. So um, don't, don't tell me more about Jesus. I know all about Jesus. Tell me something about God. 
and they would just go, well, God, uh, the Trinity, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God. Uh, yeah, 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 but that doesn't tell me anything. Well, you know, they would shake their head and go and think about it. Also, when, like on one Sunday school day, you know, they were talking about how the early Christians, you know, would be prosecuted and put to death, you know, if they admitted that they were, um, you know, Christian. And it, her point, she was trying to get to say, would you give up, you know, your life, you know, would you profess to be a Christian and then be put to death to show your faith. I'm going, that is so stupid. You, what good are you going to do as a Christian if you're dead? God knows what's in your heart. I mean, the best thing to do is say, no, I'm not a Christian, and then go about and continue to get other Christians, you know, meet with other Christians. So, yeah. I, and when I began having, uh, then I started seeing auras around people and seeing what people were thinking through their auras, and I would go home and I'd tell everybody, oh, I can just see all these things that my family would just say, Susan, Susan, stop, stop. You know, you have to tell the truth. I'm t I am telling the truth. And then when I began flying when I was nine years old after my heart was healed and I was having out-of-body experiences, but I didn't know I was out of my body. I thought I was physical fine. I was going around telling everybody in church, I can fly, I can fly. Go out there any night. Any night at all, you can see me flying. And um, my dad, you know, he had to take me aside and say, Susan, you cannot go around telling people you are flying. I'm going, I am flying. He says, that's a lie. And I was bursting into tears going, I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. I'm flying. And then he said, well, it has to be a dream. Okay, you believe, you believe you're flying. And then that's when it actually stopped until I was 17. And then the angel pulled me out. But then when I began telling people about that, Oh my gosh, did I get, have you ever been chased around your house with somebody thumping you on the head with the Bible saying, by the blood of Jesus we are saved, by the blood of Jesus we are saved. Yeah, it, it, um, it was, that was my experience, but yes, I, it changed everything. I mean, I believed differently to begin with, but then, you know, I knew the truth, but you can't just go around telling people because you'll get thumped on the head with the Bible. <laughs> One more thing I have to say, Susan, I kept mine to myself. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, it's always the shy ones. <laughs> oh, um, uh, okay, religion. Um, my mom didn't really, we didn't go to church. Um, my dad not only was an atheist, but he had anger behind it. He hated God, even though he was sure there wasn't one, but he was damn pissed about it. <laughs> um, my mom was secret, like, I, I do, but I'm afraid to say anything. Uh, my grandmother, she was very spiritual. Um, no, she, uh, at the time, you know, it, it, she was Presbyterian, but she was way high up in the church. But even her herself had uh, abilities and gifts. She's a beautiful way of saying prayers. She's just amazing. But she did tell me about Jesus, but, you know, we weren't really religious or anything. So when this happened uh, to me, um, I was so young that, um, you know, I, I came out of the hat just different, okay? I, I, um, I kept it a secret, unlike most people. I was in... Aries, I was, you know, just right out Me front. too, I'm Aries, but... <laughs> Rising Pisces, so I kept it quiet. Um, and I did because I didn't want to be locked up, but I was seeing and talking uh, to spirit people uh, as early as age three, but I knew some of them, so it was okay. And then I had people come and talk to me. And then when I was told that that was bad, then I started thinking, oh, that's bad. Uh, and then I began to feel frightened about it because I was told that wasn't good. Uh, but I never... I knew what I saw, and I knew I perceived this world differently, and I knew I was so different that I just kept quiet. Um, and for as religion, um, it's funny because <clears throat> I would say that word changed the spirituality for me. In seeing myself as a spiritual being and part of a bigger whole, um, it's funny because I, I went away from religion and Christianity because, but because of my experiences with Jesus and I keep seeing him. Although he says he's not religion, he's not in, he said, it's very nice they did that, but actually he did, he, 
tells me he did not start Christianity. <laughs> he said, I came for everybody. I'm like, okay, fair enough. But because of that, I've actually taken an interest because he shows up so much and I channel him now that I like want to know him. But not because of dogma, it's because the man and the love and he was the greatest healer and I just want to, you know, and he, all he did was talk about love and you saw what happened to him and any great um, spiritual uh, leader when they come in a presence of love has been attacked. So um, it, I think I'm more spiritual because I think religion, you're from somewhere. You're from something, <laughs> right? I mean, we're all going to be, whether you're Mormon or whatever, you, you start with that. But in reality, on the other side, I did not perceive there was any religion, but just the oneness of love. Question seven, sharing your experience with others. And we talked, or you've, you've talked about this throughout the, your conversations, but uh, this is in regards to sharing your near-death experience because some people are reluctant to do it, some people are not. Uh, but how did, it, how did you feel? Uh, when you initially had your experience, did you feel reluctant about sharing your experience with others? Oh, you know, wait a minute, let's, let's, instead of me just doing this, let's pull out the paddles. What? Pull out the paddle. Yeah. So what I, stand up. No, 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 no. Stand yeah, up. I know. That's what you'd want to do. Is, uh, but, uh, open the paddles up and, okay. and uh, use the magic marker and write yes on one side and no on the other. Okay. And then I'll, sure. when I ask each question, I'll ask you to hold up the paddle okay. with either a yes or a no. Okay. So this will be fun. Well, this this way it's all spontaneous. So yes on one side and no on the other. And and remember your oath to be truthful or, or how if you don't want to answer the question. Okay. So are we ready? Yeah. Okay. So this is first question. Um, yes or no? And and you can hold it up for the for the crowd. Uh, did you feel, re after you had your near-death experience, did you feel reluctant about sharing your experience with others, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, God. No, I think we all knew that. Uh, did, uh, question number two, uh, do you still have aspects of your near-death experience that you prefer not to talk about, yes or no? Question number three, do you have any near-death experience after effects that you prefer to keep to yourself? Yes or no? Can you put maybe? You can, I, do. You, I want to go yes and no. Yes it, and well, it, you can how. But that's I don't know. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, and, and, and this, this was why I pulled the paddle. Why I pulled the paddles out. Uh, have you been totally truthful to your spouse or significant other regarding the extent of your NDE experience and or the after effects? Yes or no? Have you been completely truthful or how? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so cool. So we, we had some fun with the paddles. But, so the, the question for the group is, is what aspect of your near-death experience uh, has been the hardest for you to talk about? If you want to share it, you don't have to share it. So it's really just whoever wants to, to speak. Can you're you ask to. the question again? Uh, what aspect of your near-death experience or experiences remains the hardest for you to talk about? If you, if you want to talk about it. As a result of my NDEs and TBIs and all of the above, um, the work that I do is, is very different. So it's, and, and the work that I do to assist others, um, that's something that I don't often share. So when people seek me out, I don't usually seek yeah. out for others, uh, uh, seek my work, um, share my work with others. Um, but. Uh, but I, I stay busy, so I'm glad I'm able to assist. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. You don't, you don't have to say anything. No, because I'm chiming in. She already felt it. Thank you. 
Um, I, I, um, I'm actually, I still struggle with this, okay? To truly be who I am and to come out um, is a little too much, you know? And, and I feel like uh, what I don't want to do is create a separation with people. I want to create a oneness with people, but I live in a different place. I mean, I, I mean, I'm always, I mean, I'm 24-7, even on the toilet, I'm talking to Jesus. <laughs> and I'm going, well, you know, so-and-so, and he's like, yeah, you don't say, I mean, he literally tells me stuff all the time. And then he brings me people that are other religions and saints over there. And he goes, I'd like you to meet someone. I'm like, okay. Hey, George Harrison, how are you? I mean, and so I can't, if people knew how... Uh, unusual I was but it's all good I'm not crazy <laughs> I, I don't and I'm trying to be my full self but I'm still learning how to do that because it's not really a safe place this world I'm gonna be honest I mean it's not really a safe place so I put myself out there and I'm vulnerable and um, you know it's it's not easy for me because energetically I am like hanging out with the angels and stuff, and then I'll come back to someone who's like, what she said, an a hole <laughs> who flips you off in traffic, and then I'm going, I'm like, why did they have to do that? Why did they have to do that? Was it that important? And so it's hard for me to still adjust. I got to be honest, and that's why I hold. I, I'm, I people may not think I'm holding back, but I, I'm thinking. You know, I know I'm not supposed to, and I'm thinking, well, what about if I was gone tomorrow? Why did I hold back? So I'm still learning myself on that. Yeah. That's what it. she said. That's it. Okay. Really? Uh, question number eight on page two. Uh, we're talking about NDE after effects. Now, uh, you've, you've heard a lot about the psychic after effects, both from the panelists and from the list that Tamara read off. But uh, let's talk about non-psychic after effects following your near-death experience. Uh, and just for example, did you, uh, did your taste in music, how you dress, or your taste in food change? Uh, did your physical, mental, or creative abilities change? And did your understanding of your purpose or focus in life change? I think you'll, you'll be able to answer that one. Um, but uh, how or why do you think these changes occurred? Two minutes each. If you want to talk about it. And if you don't, you can always howl. <laughs> oh, woo! You should start plucking some chickens up here. I'll go. Uh, since I'm working through my issues. Um, all right. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to admit I took the crazy pill. So, through when I had a lot of my near death experiences, I used to go in junior high and high school. <laughs> Unlike the regular people, I would go in the library and I would research uh, near death experiences, out of body, you know, any kind of. To Edgar Casey, I was a little weirdo, and you know, like the, the cute girls wanted me to join her group, their group, and I'm like, uh, yeah, no, you're shallow. And I would go to the, um, I would go to the library, and it was this um, thing that I have to really own now that all this time that was my fascination, and a lot of this came out later in life, and I think it's because some of mine was the trauma leading up to a lot of uh, sexual abuse from my stepdad where I told God I didn't want to be here anymore. I first asked him to kill him. Well, I was a kid. I didn't know. And then I said, all right, if he won't work, just take me. Uh, and so some of that, it wasn't just the indie and all the great stuff. It was kind of leading up to that and not necessarily wanting to be here. Uh, now, um, the fact is I'm obsessed. I have to admit, I'm obsessed with this topic. I am obsessed obsessed with doing my life purpose to the point that I don't I do I constantly do spiritual work and help people even if it's free a lot of times I cancel people till late hours on the phone my husband I don't even spend the time with him I should 
I'm completely obsessed and I leave, I mean, this is not so good. Like I leave him out of the picture a lot of times and he's a wonderful person and I am so driven because I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm getting older. I want to be able to have enough energy and, you know, not just, you know, walking around and in pain and eating bananas trying to stay heavy energy because I don't have teeth. You know, I, I want to be able to get this done that I need to because I agree to a purpose on the other side and I want to get this done. So I'm like becoming more driven and other people where they take off on Saturday, I'm doing things going toward my goal of being able to get the message of, of love, God's real, heaven's real. So is it healthy? Probably not. I, 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 I'm, I have not learned a balance, I have to tell you. I have not. And I have to say I have to work really hard to keep a balance. Um, because I, I am this moment person and I try to live in the moment because that isn't very important. Because carrying, all, all, you know, carrying this other stuff around isn't, doesn't help. And I learned that long ago. But uh, so, you know, I'm a constant student, so I'm constantly learning. Although I was reading these things in the library and bookstores early on in life, you know, I, I'm still learning. I'm still a student. Uh, question number nine is related to keeping in touch. So you had your near-death experience, but was was there any follow-up on, on your side or the other side? Uh, and you've talked about this too, so I, I don't think there's going to be too many surprises. Uh, have you remained in contact with any of the beings you encountered during one or more of your near-death experiences? And if so, how did that contact take place? Did you contact them or did they contact you? Uh, did they come in dreams, and if they did, um, did you ever return back to the environment where you were during your near-death experience? So, uh, have you remained in contact with any of the beings that uh, you met during your near-death experience? The only one that I can think of is, is the voice that I heard in my first near-death experience, and I'm assuming it was the voice of God. It was a, it was a divine voice, voice for sure. So that's the voice I hear from, off, quite often actually. Um, someone Sharon asked me yesterday. I answered something. She said, "How did you know that?" And I said, "I heard a voice." So I hear the I hear voices quite often. <laughs> a voice, a voice. Let me put it that way. So that's the only. Thing, only one that I can connect to. There's that. There's that voice that has answers for me. So. Okay. Come on. <laughs> I know she wants to say something. <laughs> every day. I have contact every day. With more than like one. Like what? What? With who? God or God. God. angels or above all the above? Is that the supreme refined energy enters my heart and I feel the expansion and all I have to do is really sit down and close my eyes. It's there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I know God is around me, but I really connect with Jesus because I don't feel so bad talking his head off. I would feel bad talking <laughs> God's head off. And I'm like, what about this? What about that? This goes on in my dreams. I wake up midway through the night, and then I'm like, and they're talking to me. I wake up exhausted, but um, it, it's funny. I'm now getting this new thing, and I got it a couple weeks where I'm not saying I don't feel the presence of God. I do, but like I'm getting messages directly from God and I woke up two weeks ago and and I was so excited it was God that I'm like oh my gosh and I woke up I said don't let me forget and I go back to sleep and I did it like four times and uh, um, he started she the creator started giving me these messages but the minute that I got the message I already knew the whole communication cycle it was like really really quick it was like boom I knew it boom I knew it boom it was like very very fast and um, I have always felt connected and don't feel connected, but I think that's the secret, is that I always have conversations. What did they tell you? 
Do you really want to know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Please, just no, a little. Darn. Um, this is what I got. Gosh, you guys. Okay, I posed a question and God responded. I said, um, what's wrong with people? Why? And, um, you know, there are so many people I know, like light workers, and they try so hard to do charity work and help people, and I know that. And they work endless hours. I get it. And then you have other people that oppose that. And I was asking, I guess, you know, God, what's going on? And he replied, and he... And it was, it was quick because it was not really a voice. It was like a knowingness, quickness, and, a, and, a, and power. And uh, so I can, my human words don't do this justice. Um, he said self-help, uh, any kind of these practices, or, or like do this in 20 days, or, or even like all these, some are called New Age, but some are also like just stuff people make up. You know what I mean? They just make up a thing, and then like it's the thing. And he said that, all that is a distraction away from him, and he wants people, he, she, look, I'm just going to say he gets complicated, but uh, he wants people to come back to God, to co-create and be one with God, and all this stuff is just, this is me talking BS away from that, and I felt a reverence and like kind of a pissed offness a little bit, and I was like, wow, because I've never really experienced that before, but like, he, he said that people are grabbing at just whatever like the next best like a weight loss thing is instead of looking to that and um and said that it has my i am not in there and he goes all the answers are are available and ready for people but they're looking at the next best whatever and uh he also told me he did not like the word christ consciousness he said he was alive and he said he is who he says he is and he is today and forever, and he's alive. It's not like he's dead and his consciousness exists. He said he's all alive. And, and I was like, uh, I was like, what do I do with that? <laughs> so he seemed kind of pissed, okay? You know, like a parent when they're kind of like, and I've never felt an angry God. I always felt a loving God. But I think he's frustrated because um, it's like he wants his children to come back home and show their love and be one and instead they're separated into all these activities instead of you know God is God it doesn't matter where you're from you know it's, it's the same source so. and the last question on, on the list so and thank you for making it to this point um, what do you consider to be the most important lesson that you learned from your near death experience that you would like to share with other people so and Two, two, two minutes. Okay. Two seconds. Mm -hmm. It's all about love. That's what. <clears throat> that's very true. It's um, like Tamara was saying with um, about God um, and the fact that you are God yourself. Your I am presence. If you sit down and just concentrate on the I am, you will find God within you. And God is always there. God is always waiting on us. God has never turned away from us. We have turned away from God. And um, to be the love, I always feel like love is synonymous with God because God is that refined energy that's all love. And um, we are love, and that is my purpose, is to be that love to everyone I come in contact with and help remind people who they are. I don't know, that, that's a tough off. I agree, that's so beautiful, remind people of who they are. Yes, that's what hurts me, my pain, is they don't, people don't see their beauty. And uh, I hear some people that are upset, they don't even want to be here, and I, and I'm like, look, God felt you were important enough to be here now. There is purpose and life in you, so you should look at it as a gift. Because trust me, if you're not meant to be here, you're taken out. <laughs> I mean, you're gone. I mean, if it's not your time, God needs you. I mean, there's nothing you can do. Um, to me, I feel like that uh, every day I'm learning. I'm probably not doing a very good job of it, but I'm trying to learn about being uh, humble and vulnerable, and it really sucks. 
Um, but it's but the thing is, I think people can see through BS. So um, you know, if I can try to be genuine, then other people can too. But I think that um, Jesus told me this when I was in the higher level of heaven, and I have to go with this, and I'm still learning what this means. He said, "Be love, receive love, give love." So I'd, I'd like to thank you all. We're, it's uh, 1 o'clock. But uh, uh, Tamara said this a few times. This, these were all beautiful answers, very much from the heart. Uh, you were very honest and uh, very truthful. And uh, I, I really appreciate your being vulnerable and, and answering these questions. And uh, we wanted to try and make this, you know, um, more than what you hear in, in other NDE accounts, although m many people... Uh, when they talk about their near-death experiences, it, they get emotional as well. But uh, I hope you learned something new and something different from the panel today, and um, uh, you can feel free. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I, could we take five minutes or a couple minutes if anyone has any questions? Just cause I, I, is that I, okay? I, I was going to ask you guys. I didn't want to put you on okay. the spot. Mm -hmm. Could we take a couple questions I from the audience? I would like them to... I, engage because I yeah. feel like we're just here I would like them to yeah. engage I, uh, I I wanted to respect your time because you know I wanted to be able to get out at one o'clock but we will stay here if you need to leave for any reason please feel free to but if not okay. I'll uh, take some questions from the floor good afternoon I've uh, watched a lot of different videos on YouTube regarding this topic. I've met with a person who had this happen to him. He's known, his name is Danny Brinkley. And he's yeah, famous if you've heard yeah. him. Watched him. But, so I have different questions and it's sometimes like, I wish this interviewer asked this person this question. And one of them is you hear about sometimes seeing deceased, departed um, loved ones. Mm -hmm. What about people that's actually had, I know sometimes I've heard of situations where they've met um, spiritual beings that were they didn't know about. But then what about famous people? What about someone who's met like Elvis or Albert Einstein or Bruce Lee? Has anybody had any encounter where they've like met someone of that type of caliber? I can answer it if you want. Yeah. Yeah. I have an answer too. Oh, you do? Okay, go yeah. ahead. Um, famous this generation is uh, Father Padre Pio. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if everybody knows who he is, but. Um, he came with me for, with a message one day, and out of nowhere, and I knew exactly who he was. Uh, so, and he gave me the advice that I needed to study Ho'oponopono, which I had never heard of in my life. So, he's as close to famous this generation that I, that I can think of. Um, yes, I get them too. I got a guy the, um, a, a few months ago who spent the whole night with me talking. He said his name was uh, Saint Loya Ignatius. I didn't know who knew the Ignatian religion, religion who started the Jesuits. I didn't know he was famous, but he um, he had dark eyes and he had uh, he looked kind of dark skin. Uh, like he had a tan and he had dark eyes and he was kind of petite and he had like uh, the ring around his head but bald on top and dark and he went around with a donkey telling me parables and I'm like that's odd <laughs> and <laughs> and apparently he studied Jesus and started the Jesuits um, but it's really odd and what I'm a professional psychic medium but oh, in my reading I was reading this dude and this shocked me I wanted to shut it down but there was a guy um, from Florida, I didn't know him from anything. I was doing a reading. Relatives came through. Everything's cool. And at the end, I was like, No, no, my guides are going to say it. Say it. I'm like, No, 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 say it. I said, Einstein is here. And I said, And the guy, <laughs> the guy, I said, uh, and I said, They tell me to go ahead. He goes, Go ahead. And the guy was laughing and crying. I was like, What is going on? And the guy started talking about um, that we're soul brothers. And then he started talking about the probability of chickens. I always get chickens, but the probability of chickens, the hens versus the roosters, which is brown eggs, which are white eggs. And then said, he had something for you. So he took on a piece of paper. We're doing a Zoom session. And he had me write down these numbers and stuff. 
And I was like, oh God, please don't make me write numbers down. I failed real estate math twice. And so uh, we did, I held it up and the guy's crying, I said, and I felt weird. I said, do you know what this means? So the guy was born the same day that Einstein died and he told me he was finishing his book on relativity. He's, that's his life's work. And the equation that he gave him was the equation that he needed. So, uh, and the chickens later on, the whole chicken thing, he found out the next day in a book in Italy that he did the chicken probability and sent that to me. And he, uh, so the guy was ecstatic to know that the person he loved and admired and studied was watching him. So if we hear music and we go, wow, I just love the Beatles. Guess who's, guess who's beside you going, I'm so glad you like that. I haven't been anybody except God and Jesus. <laughs> angels? Oh, an angel. What's an angel? An angel is a direct manifestation of you. God sent to you personally. I love it. You can write that down. Uh, I got a question. Like recently, there has been issues with uh, scientism that's growing. And basically, what they're saying is um, science has all the answers. Um, and they want evidence. And what do you think the role of um, you know these experiences play in um, you know science? I know what you. I think know that. you want to hear this. I know, I know it. science okay. will prove that everything we yeah. experience is real. Well, they'll finally get there. <laughs> I heard many years ago that, and someone asked me the question like you did, uh, and I heard clearly that. God is science, and science is God. Okay. Um, you may not, Mark is a science guy. He probably won't like my answer. I don't think we have the resources. I think the stuff that we experience, or I, I, I don't know if you agree, but it's multidimensional, and I think it's, you know, the fifth dimension or whatever. But I think we don't have the science. I uh, was driving, I was... Uh, going to actually speak at Ein's in Raleigh, and I was talking to Jesus, okay, <laughs> he was like, oh, I'm glad he's patient, and, I, and he said, well, I said, I'd like a sign, he said, well, you would not believe me, I'm like, try me, do it anyway, I'm driving down the road, and I start seeing white feathers, and I'm getting ready, I'm calling ass, like 75, 80 miles an hour, getting ready to get on the ramp, and I'm having this conversation, just flying, and all of a sudden I see white feathers coming down in front of me and I'm feeling, I think I have a, this is a mirage, but it's not because I'm seeing them on the pavement and they're like pretty big. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a chicken. It's a chicken truck. We're back to chickens. <laughs> and I didn't see a chicken truck. So I thought, all right, where are these feathers coming? Because I'm thinking like a human, where are these freaking white feathers coming from? If I look, it's only in my lane for at least a football field, thousands coming down. It was like someone had a Ziploc open the sky, stuck the feathers down, and there they are manifested. And he goes, I told you you wouldn't believe me. And I could not stop laughing. I, I, there's no science to explain stuff manifesting like that. So I don't think we have the science. Sorry, Mark. Listen, didn't you want to say anything? No, I just, I think that science will continue. I I think science will continue to investigate to prove that there are other dimensions. I think there's already been proof of that, and uh, that they, they discovered a fourth dimension, and so that eventually that they will realize it, it is all one. It's the same. I just wanted to add two two quick things. If you go to the if you do decide to become a professional member of IONS, they publish the Journal of Near Death Studies, and if you're looking for science in support of near death experience, you'll find it. Mm -hmm in this journal. Another thing, if you don't want to spend the $125 for professional membership, if you go to Google Scholar, Google, you go to Google and you, you pull down the drop down of all the different things like Gmail and Google Drive and all that, there's a Google Scholar application as part of Google. If you go to Google Scholar and you type in the search words near death experience, what Scholar does is it will search all of the open access professional journal articles related to that subject and you'll find some articles that are pulled from here some that are pulled from psychological journals everything so if you're looking for scientific evidence and support you can find a lot there as well 
uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that too, is because that's what my book's about. Uh, and uh, most people, like when you have theologians that talk to scientists to try and say that God exists and no, no God doesn't exist, that's something that you can't prove, just like the multiple dimensions. You can't prove it, you can't disprove it. But if you look at the edges of reality, you might can find ways to where you can, can uh, tip, the, tip the needle one way or the other. So uh, there's some experiments in the book that I wrote that uh, try to show you that reality uh, is or could be wave-based as opposed to particle-based, and it could be multi-dimensional as opposed to three-dimensional. And I think if you, if you look at the boundaries and try and do experiments to move the needle on the boundary and to move the, the needle off the three-dimensional particle boundary into a multi-dimensional wave boundary, that's where you can make changes. Uh, but on anything else to say that you know it's multi-dimensional, it, that God exists, all this, it's, it, you can't prove it or disprove it. <coughs> Uh, so work at the boundaries. Also, if you look at processes, uh, work them backwards. So if people ask questions about eternal life, start with eternal life and, and make assumptions about what eternal life is like. And this is just for example, and then work back to your life on earth. If you are having trouble uh, answering questions of life, you know, start, start with something off in the distance and make assumptions and work your way back to where you are and then use that as... Uh, the premises for answering that question. And those are two things that I did in my book, and you can buy my book and see what I just said. So, uh, but that's the only thing I found that you could do. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> this question is for you, Daystar. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of um, when you were talking about what you do to help people transition, is that kind of what you do? I, there, yeah, I, I assist folks crossing, yeah, that's not what, all that I do, but I, that's a part of my life, right. yes. Yeah, I was, I was curious about that because my experience was uh, when my husband was passing, I started receiving all these insights and visions and just, you know, as he got closer to that, so I was just, and you kind of, um, that, we're talking like that might be kind of what went on when you were with people. So that's why, part of why I'm here is because of that experience. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. apart, it's not, it's not my major work, but I do hear from folks from time to time who have passed. And I would hear from family members to check to see if they have crossed to the other side and I can go in and check and see if they've had any difficulty. If not, I get with my, my folks, I say my guides, my backup, and we all get together. And usually I will see someone on the other side who's waiting for the loved one to cross over. And um, so that's how it works with me, is helping those open a window, a door, for those to cross. And I will most likely see someone on the other side who's waiting for them. It's like that TV show. I can't remember the name of it now. I watch it. I don't know. On CW. And she helps people cross over. Touch my sister. Touch, <coughs> touch my name. Maybe. No. Ghost whisperer. Ghost whisperer. <coughs> so have you, have you connected with your husband since? I mean, do you have this connection? It was uh, just at that moment? Well, it was kind of in maybe those stages. few months leading stages, up. Stages, yeah. 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 yeah, stages. And then since then, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe. Yeah. But it can, it can happen. Is a thing. Yeah, and I deal with those who who are preparing for their their journey. And I had don't know if I've ever read this. And my sister here has said she's experienced this. But I deal with those who are preparing for their journey who hasn't crossed yet, um, who are preparing and visiting loved ones, you know, mm -hmm. before they move on. Uh, also, too, Raymond Moody wrote a book called Glimpses of yeah. of Beyond the Light or Glimpses. Glimpses of Glimpses of, of the Light, light. Of the yeah, light. and it's light. about shared death experiences, so the things that you're, you're experiencing, yeah. uh, Raymond Moody wrote about. Yes. Can I say one thing real quick? I feel like, and you tell me what you think, but I feel like that um, crossing over to the other side, we'll leave it at that, um, it's a process, and I feel like that even people that don't know uh, they know, for example, you ever see like old people and they sleep a lot? Someone that maybe your family and you notice they sleep a lot, right? Well, while they're sleeping, 
they're doing what we do all the time. They're preparing, they're talking to their loved ones. They're talking to them and they go, oh, I had the craziest dream. And they're preparing as a process. Because think about a baby being born. They're what, closer to this side or the other side? The other side. So if you're like 95, are you closer to this side or the other side? So I think it's a process. God gets them ready. You want to say anything about that? Yeah, okay. okay. And uh, uh, also, too, for uh, your parents or, you know, older people, they won't tell you some of the stories that, that they have or some of the dreams they have, the conversations they have. So as much as you can encourage people to talk about it, you'll find out, you know, some of those stories or some of those conversations that, that they might have. And, and to encourage other people to let them talk instead of saying, oh, no, it's crazy or you're imagining or whatever. Is, is let them talk. So those were the three hands that I saw. Does anybody else have a question? Going once, going twice. Okay. Can I ask another one? So, huh? Can I ask another yeah, one? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so what do the spirits do on the other side all the time? And if you, like, say, transition now in a thousand years, what are you going to be doing? Who knows? <laughs> I, I can answer that. Um, part of um, part of my training as a mediumship, one of the things that we do have trained with a lot of famous people, is that I personally don't believe in bringing through people like, oh, it hurts, and, and at the end, their, their knees, and I mean, because that's not our best moment, right, when we're passing, whatever that is, let's say if, if there's an illness, but uh, we uh, was trained that we ask what they're doing there, and it can be extremely evidential. Uh, and they do stuff. They play music. They learn. Uh, a friend of mine passed who was a Dutch artist. He used to be my art director at my advertising agency. And he came through the lap neck. People say, oh, they don't come through. It takes them a while. I had people come through immediately like, like, hey! He came through, talked to me, and said, you won't believe there's philosophers here. Oh, my gosh, the art. And his art changed before he passed. It became very vibrant in the colors like almost garish and because there's so much more colors there and it looked magical his his whole art changed it became nature but magical looking and he never did nature before he always did contemporary and he told me all the people he's training with i've had in multiple readings to tell you what they're doing i'm like he liked so and so musician they're like yeah well he's hanging out with them over there that's what they're talking about but they do they do things if they uh one guy came through to talk about uh, he was a doctor in life and said that he's studying the tectonic plates of the, of land. And they said that's what he always wanted to do. So there's lots of learning and music and singing. I told Jesus I wanted a disco party. I said they're about over there, you know, Gloria Gaynor, Donna Summer, half the Bee Gees. I'm, 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 that's yeah, no, what I want. And she's a disco then. queen, so like yeah. you're all invited. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah. Um, my dad visited me for nine months before he, before he died. And once he died, I realized he had been visiting me. And once he died, he was back here helping me with whatever I needed and, and, and letting me know if there's a death in the family, he would show up and, and knew what to expect. But probably, I don't know, 10 years ago, I, you know, and he came for years and years and still shows up from time to time. He came to get my grandson just a few weeks. He said, come on, son, we've got work to do. But, uh, but probably nine years ago, he wasn't coming as, as often, and I asked him one day when he showed, I said, Dad, what are you doing these days? I haven't seen you lately. And he said, I've been assisting with a wedding in India. So. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it goes back to like vibrational and vibrational levels. So when a person passes, they're going to go to that level where they currently are vibrational. I mean, if, uh, if you're a, a you know a, a spiritual person, then you would um, go to a, a level where you can still learn and you know, learn more of spiritual things and involve yourself spiritually and help spiritually. But if you are someone who is of a lower vibrational level, and say I was to give an example. Uh, someone who is a, a, a murderer or you know has no feeling or compassion for other people where well, they're going to go to that that same level uh, when they pass on they're not going to be suddenly enlightened they have to uh, learn there or 
or if they're learning so slowly on one thing that's what reincarnation is all about and sometimes people will reincarnate almost immediately because you can learn so much faster here on the uh, earth level than you can really learn on the vibrational level it's not that you can't learn there but learning here is faster and you will um, that's what they say here is that uh, you repeat something until you get it right and so that's why so many people come back over and over again but yes when you pass on you will go to that level which you currently vibrate okay. cool. yeah. do you all believe in reincarnation I yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wait. Yeah, we can do the panels. <laughs> <laughs> reincarnation. Okay. You believe everyone reincarnates, not well, most. I'm, most. I'm gonna say most. most. You don't most. have to, but it is the. Um, and you know, I, and if you're real, if you're a real spiritual person, you kind of hope you don't have to. <laughs> you know, if you're a murderer, you go to a level where they were murderers. Well, it, it doesn't. Kind of we, are you going to be committing murders? No, that? no. It doesn't mean that you'll be interacting with other murderers, but that is the vibrational level which you mm -hmm. will be thinking at. Mm -hmm. There will be. Uh, spiritual beings there to try to assist you and help you to evolve uh, and most often people of that level will be those that were reincarnated will they be just as evil though they might be that's one that they and get they to come back and try evil. not to be an evil person or, or, they can be evil, evil spirits things. around you then they can leave wherever they are right and come Hopefully. down to earth and be evil well and influence. there are there are protections here as well, well. i know you just say yeah. leave go you know well but <laughs> there are do that it's like um there are, we do have our own spiritual protections uh, it's hard to describe it's hard even to put into word all the multiplicities of the involvement of the vibrations of the earth and what's involved here is being a, a spiritual format in in evolution um, I have been very very fortunate that I have had very few evil influences attack me or try even to try to attack me I was uh, in a seminar similar to this one day and somebody said what about the incubus and does he got succubus and I said I've never encountered that at all in any out of body experience that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And um, that night, that person sent a very evil kind of energy to me uh, mm -hmm. to uh, attack me, and I saw it. And it was uh, I was laying in. Uh, I, 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 I might have. I think I don't know that I saw it physically, but I saw it in the spiritual. And it was this black. It looked like a black bat I guess it was a succubus to, to drain my energy and I I called out and I said God God help me help me God and I felt my my energies rising up and then I felt this this hand on my shoulder and um, it was my husband Jerry now we're just women because and he said it's okay Susan I'm here I'm here Susan I'm here I'm, thank you so I feel so much better and I went back to sleep Jerry had not arrived yet I was expecting him and that it was an angel who appeared as my husband Jerry to get rid of that fear but by, by no longer be my not feeling fear absolutely dispel that negative energy I, I wish I could explain it better about what protections we have because they're the energies are all around us. It's uh, it is all about vibration. The level that you vibrate at, the level they vibrate at. Mm -hmm. Some levels of energy they can't come near you because of their lower energy and the mm -hmm. level that you are vibrating at. They cannot they cannot move past their point to be of harm to you. Does that make better sense? Because of the vibration, they can't move into the light if they are not of that vibration. They cannot attack you. Well, I was, I was attacked in an out-of-body experience. Well, yeah, when you're out of body, yeah. sometimes, see, that, I mean, because I understand, I heard you talk about vibrating, and, and while you were describing, you feel the vibrations, and, and, and you feel like it's your physical body, but it's actually you're feeling the vibrations of your energies raising up. And when you get out of body, a lot of times, 
your mind controls where you go and or what you're experiencing and you can encounter if you're not invoking protection for yourself before you leave your body to prevent other energies out there that are that are negative or are of not like uh, energy like you are that can come in contact with you. I, as I said, I've been very fortunate. I must have good protection because whenever I've been out of my body, I have I have never come in. That, that was the only yeah, time that somebody sent way. somebody directly <laughs> to me to be of a negative influence. So. Yeah, it, it is good if you do practice out of body experiences before you lay down to go out of body to surround yourself with the light of God and ask God to send you angels and protection for your journey. It's an important thing to tell everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me add one Sorry. thing going back. <laughs> no, 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 that was you. good. Uh, going back to this question about science, if you believe in vibrations, if you believe in waves, uh, if you believe in you know angels and spirits, if you believe in UFOs that disappear, you're you're talking about a wave-based reality. So you you your reality is different from a particle-based reality because it can't happen in a particle-based reality. So if, if you've never thought about this before, you you're working in a different worldview. So if, if you believe in some of these things, just realize that that your worldview is different from. Oh, is that what it is? Is that what it is? I believe no, that all and, energy. And it's, and it's, actually, it's actually normal. You know, it, it's normal. in a wave based, multi dimensional reality. This is normal. Yes, it's what. This is normal. And uh, so if you believe it or, or think you believe it, you're leaning more toward this <laughs> as what reality really is as opposed to three dimensional, three dimensions and particle. And I just and a lot of people don't think about it. They just well, go go on their their merry way. But this is the real reality, uh, and and a particle three D is just you know for the uh, the little uh, playroom that we're in called yeah, Earth. Yes. While yes, we're yes, learning yes. all this stuff this to keep everything way. simple, mm -hmm. but the real reality is. Much it's like that's complex. what I love about the Matrix because that the Matrix is what our reality. Is. Yeah. I, I, should, I should try and explain to myself because I have no one else to talk to about leaving your body. How do you leave your body and get out of your body? And I was thinking particles that we have spaces between us that are empty and our spirit or whatever it is leaves through that. Yeah. But that's a particle base. There, there's, uh, there's organizations that's, that, that will teach this. you how to do that. The Monroe Institute has a class on out-of-body experiences. Yeah, Monroe. Didn't have much success on yeah. So. And uh, there's another guy in Portugal who has a set of books out on how to have out-of-body experiences. Uh, Llewellyn Publications, they, they make books more uh, for astral projection and things like that. But they they have some books that'll tell you that. But it's it's a, uh, a different kind of life. Let me say that with their with their books. But uh, the Monroe Institute and um, uh, this guy in Portugal, uh, I forget his name. But there there are there are groups, there are books that can teach you how to do that and to do some of the preparation work to make sure you have a safe journey. And, huh. Yeah, and those are the kind of things that we can get into more in depth with far as you know, lunch and people ask questions, and we can yeah. do more of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'll let Tom. I'll let Tom ask the question. Been, this will be the last been, question. Yeah, he's been waiting a long time. It's, it's one thirty. I sure forgot what my question was, but I'll come up with another one. Uh, why do you think some people have negative experiences in these, like going to going to hell and that sort of thing? Oh, God. Wake them up. <laughs> Wake them up. I mean, that, that's the only thing. I, when I've heard that, it, all I can say is that if, if, if they needed that to be, well, I, I think people can hear me pretty good. If, if they needed that to wake them up to live a better life, then that's, what, that's why I would think that they experienced it. You know, it's, uh, I'm sure it changed them, but, you know, I, I, I have... I have heard that, and it's just, it's mind-boggling to mm -hmm. me that somebody does have a near-death experience that is negative. And you look like you wanted to say well, something. Well, I didn't have a near-death experience, but one of my first experiences, not knowing what this was all about, I went to hell. And I felt the, I don't know, imps or whatever, like, biting at me and 
trying to nibble at me, and the sounds I heard were just god awful. Okay, god awful. But I wasn't a bad person. It's just that I didn't know anything about whatever, and they were able to come in. Can I ask you a question? What What were you brought up to believe? Were you brought up to believe in hell or with imps and fire? I don't think so. I went to Sunday school, Presbyterian <coughs> Sunday school, and they didn't really talk about it. I didn't know anything about imps and you know, a, lo a lot of times people will experience if I like did, it was what they believe. That's why when, you know, if someone who's Buddhist died, the person that they would see before them would be Buddha, whereas we based in Christian very often see Jesus. And I think a lot of times, too, that what people expect to experience when they die is what they initially experience because that's what they expect to see. Now, you want to say something? Go ahead. You don't. You're like I'm not touching this. Okay, I'm going to touch this. Yeah, touch it. I'm going to touch it. Okay, <laughs> and then we're going to freaking watch the Thai food. Um, I have done about 15 or 16 deliverances, and I have seen angels and demons. I have the gift of discernment, and they are real. However, I don't live in that world. I don't like looking at it. Okay, just like there's right there's criminals out there, but I don't focus on the weirdo criminals. Okay, I focus on God loving people but they are out there and i tell people all the time if you don't do any weird shit then you're fine most of the time but usually you'll find they'll do voodoo hoodoo some bizarre blood thing it's that i come across that one the latest one was someone's trying to call something through, out through mirrors i'm like what, what? i know call things out of mirrors oh, mirrors I, look, I, I've heard all sorts of crazy stuff, but the thing is, if you're in, if your mindset, I, and that that's in the that's in the list of weird stuff. Um, but if, uh, but as far as I have heard, people have hellish experiences. I do believe that is to could be a couple twofold to to first of all wake you up. The second thing is that dimension does exist. But guess what? I don't want to live there. But <laughs> If I'm in that vibration where I feel it, I feel it personally in my chest right away. And it's a sense of dread and it's a heaviness. You know what I mean? Some people feel nauseous. Some people get tingly in their hand, whatever their thing is. But when I feel it, what does that mean? I leave if I park someplace. And, and if I feel that, I'm like, I, I don't need to know. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it so? Do I need to go in there and find that there's a no. murder in it? At the, at the Walmart, you know what I mean? I just go, I'm just going to leave. I mean, it does exist, but just, you know, I don't freak out. I use it as a GPS, yeah. like, I'm out of here. I'm out of this place. Yes, you say protection. Put you around, surround yourself with the light of God. And, you know. Yeah, know it, be aware of it, and go, okay, I don't want a part of that. No, thank you, God, I don't want a part of it. You, you put yourself, I do a little God white light bubble around myself. And then I visualize like a posse of angels behind me, like with a theme song. Uh, <laughs> Did that answer that better? It is a realm that exists, but we can choose. That's a much lower level. Yeah, it's a much lower level, not a fun level. I like the angel level. Do you want to say something positive, Daystar? Mm -hmm. Me too. I like the angels. She likes the angels. The angels are way better. So, okay. so let's give our panel a hand. <laughs> So thank you for your honesty and and yes. for your vulnerability, you know, with with the answers because I know they're very personal to you and and all and I think it's it's helped us get a broader perspective and understanding of what near death experience is all about in the after effects and I want to thank you all for that.